Today's discussion is going to be around dry hopping. It's a topic that comes up a lot on the bulletin boards and brewer circles as far as best practices. And let me start by saying there's many, many different ways. There's different types of hops, pellet versus cone. There's the topic of do I put them in bags or let them be freely suspended? What temperature should I dry hop at? What's the duration? How long should they be in there? And so while there's all different kinds of implementations of dry hopping at both the home brewer and the commercial brewer level, I thought it would be beneficial for you to at least see a complete end-to-end -end process and from there make your own decisions adapt it to how you would like to include dry hopping into your process and at least have a reasonably good starting point. So let's go ahead, take a look at the batch of beer that I have and add the hops. So what we'll be doing today is working with a conical fermenter like this. Now you may ferment in a carboy or other vessel, and to me that so much doesn't matter. The conical makes it nice, however, because at the end of the process, all of the sediment particulates will have sank all the way down to the bottom of the conical fermenter, and then you can easily draw the beer off the top of it. Whether you're using a racking cane or other transfer vehicle, the basic notion is the same. We want to leave as much of the hot particulate, as well as the rest of the tube, spent yeast and what have you, in the vessel and not in our final serving container. So here I have one and a half ounces of pellet hot. I like to use pellets. I find them much easier. There's a lot of conversation around cone being better for dry hopping versus the pellet. And it's my opinion that this is largely due to the older processes used when developing pellets that the heat would actually cause some of the attributes that would cause some of the potential off flavors during the dry hopping. Due to the process improvements these days, I don't think that's a factor anymore, so I use pellets. You'll also notice I'm not going to use a bag. I'm going to simply pour them in through the hole at the top of the fermenter, let them freely uh, be suspended within the beer, and then go ahead and do a crash cold process to help make sure they all drop out and sink to the bottom before I actually transfer the beer. Now on that note, you'll also notice that I have my temperatures monitored. 11 and a half degrees centigrade is going to be roughly 51 degrees. I like to use a temperature in that range when I do my dry hopping. This is an area of a lot of controversy and conversation. Some profess it's got to be at fermentation temperatures. Some profess it has to be at cold temperatures. I kind of split the difference. I'm going to add the hop 50 degrees let it sit for about five days, crash the temperature, transfer out of the conical. So let's go ahead, open up the fridge, fermentation's done, add the hops, and start the clock. Before I add the hops in my dry hop process, I'm going to first go ahead and draw a sample of the beer as it now stands just after fermentation so I can do a comparison of the two different products. One, straight out of the conical. The second one will be the dry hop version. So I'll just take a little bit here. That ought to do it. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to just take off the blow-off tube, gently dump in the hops, Put the blow-off tube back on, shut the door, wait for five days. Let's see what happens.
right, there we go. The only other thing I'd done prior to this is sprayed the top of the conical with some star sand, make sure everything's sanitary, and uh, there you have it. When I go into my crash chill, I'll go ahead and clue you back in, and we'll take a look at what we get. Okay, it has been five days since I added the hops, so now I'm just in the crash cooling process. And it's nice, if you see my video regarding fermentation temperature control, this is just one more attribute of it. Here I have my uh, temperature control unit. I simply program down to three and a half degrees Celsius, which is going to give me about 39 degrees. Hit the button, it automatically adjusts the temperature down, and that crash cooling process is going to have all of the suspended particle, be it yeast and or hop, to sink down to the bottom of the conical. Then I'll easily be able to dump it off. So we're going to sit here for a couple days, let things settle out, and I'll be back with you to make the transfer. Okay, we're all set to do the transfer, and let me cover what I'm going to do first. I'm going to go ahead and take an empty jar and just pull off any of the trub off the bottom of the conical here. I'll pick up tubes up here for the beer to flow out. And I want as much of the sediment to be down below this, this place here. It's inevitable you'll pick up some, but we want to minimize it. So let's go ahead and do that right now. You can kind of see what's coming off the bottom here. Um, I've, I've dumped the trube a couple times already. So what we have is a pretty runny liquid, but you can see even in the color that that's a lot of the, the hop that was once floating on the top and due to the cold crash and the time given allows it to sink all the way back down and so we can get rid of it. I'll show you one other one. I took this a couple days ago and you can really see how much of that sediment is going to be in the bottom of your carboy, your conical, your bucket, whatever you're using and that's the stuff we want to leave behind. But you can also see how effective this is, even without a bag. Let time and temperature clarify the beer that you're going to transfer. Once I'm done, I'm going to go ahead and take this full cell glass and put the dry hop beer in it. I'm going to take this other glass and I'm going to take a sample of the pre-dry hop. Remember when I first did this, I took some of the beer out prior to dry hopping so we can have a comparison. So let me do some work here. I'll join you in just a minute and, and we'll take a look at the results. And by the way, to do my transfer, all I have to do, pull this handle down, the beer will flow into the keg. Be back in a minute. Okay, the transfer is done. Um, and again, what we have is the dump from a couple days ago, just to let that settle out. The dump I took off the bottom, um, just a few minutes ago to show that there's still a lot. You can see the kind of greenish color. You can see that a lot of that hop definitely found its way to the bottom. This is the dry hopped beer. Can't wait to give that a shot. And then this sample is what I took, recall, stored in my little milk bottle so I can compare the two. By the way, with my keg, with the beer I'm storing, I always put a nitrogen blanket down first to avoid any oxidation from occurring. Let me uh, grab the camera I'll show you what the inside of the conical looks like and you see what's left over. So here's the inside of the conical. You can see on the, the wall of course at the top the uh, leftover uh, yeast from the Krausen that was formed. Then you see a lot of little um, particulate along the side. You know this stuff over here. That's a little bit of leftover hop residue. And at the bottom, the beer that was not transferred out, covering up what's left of the very bottom uh, portion of the fermenter, where I'm pretty sure it's going to be filled with nothing but a bunch of muck that you don't want anyway. So now for the fun part. Let's turn this off and taste some beer. Okay, the moment of truth, we're going to taste these beers. And remember, dry hopping is just one option that you can add to your brewing process. It's not appropriate for every beer or every beer lover's taste. So, 
I always try to think, what am I trying to go for when I do the dry hop process, and do I need it at all? This particular beer is a pale. I want a little more hop assertiveness, a little more hop forward uh, presentation, and so I elected to go with a little bit of Amarillo and Willamette to give it that little extra touch, a little extra complexity. So let's go ahead and see what we got. Here's the first uh, beer, non-dry hop. Smells nice. On its own, that is a delicious beer. Very good. Now, let's see what the dry hopping added to it. Mm-hmm. I'll show you here, you can actually taste this. I would say it's kind of more on the south side. The Amarillo really gives it a nice, nice complexity. A little bit of a, uh, a, a, the citrus note, but not your crazy citra type of thing. Um, boy, but what a difference. Both good, and that's the thing. You could give both these beers to the same people. Some would like one over the other just because of their personal uh, preference. As a brewer, I like to see, did I achieve what I wanted to in the dry hop? <clears throat> Boy, that's good. I'd order either of them, both of them, at a bar. So there you have it. End to end, start to finish, pellet hop, temperature control, five days duration, crash chilling, for a clarification. Now all I've got to do, condition, carbonate, and I'll have a wonderful keg of beer ready to go. I hope this helps you. Feel free to send any questions, and we'll see you later.